everybody. This is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. I hope you're all doing very well today. So, as some of you may know, I really enjoy talking about the lower level Hall of Famers and the stars that may have really kind of been overshadowed or just bypassed through history or forgotten through history. And one of those players that I'm going to tell you about today is George McQuinn from the St. Louis Browns. And uh, George McQuinn was actually a seven-time All-Star, and he was a star on the Browns, which uh, is, is really kind of a, a lower-level team. Uh, they only won one uh, pennant in, uh, the, in the time in which they were around, and uh, that was actually 1944. It's, uh, it's the first time that McQuinn is actually in a World Series and I think he was the only member of the St. Louis Browns to hit a home run during that World Series. Uh, it, it came down to six games. So, um, interestingly enough, the Browns uh, lost by one game in 1922 for the uh, pennant that year against the uh, New York Yankees. And uh, the, the Yankees actually... Um, wanted George Brown in 1939. It was his first year um, as an All-Star. Uh, he didn't actually um, play in the All-Star game in 1939, but he was selected. And uh, he had a really decent year in 1939 where the Yankees um, actually purchased his contract from the Browns. But for whatever reason, there's a, a, a really odd um, rule that uh, Judge Landis um, kind of put down, or, or the um, the American League had, where um, the the Yankees couldn't actually purchase his contract um, because they had won the World Series. Now, I don't really understand this rule at all, and I don't know when it disappeared, um, but that's actually the first of two uh, trades that did not go through for uh, McQuinn and, uh, in 1942. McQuinn actually is traded again to the, the Brooklyn Dodgers for uh, Dolph Camilli, and uh, that that trade also was next. And uh, I'm not entirely sure why that trade was next, but uh, it, it never went through. Um, McQuinn actually... He's he's a really decent ball player for for his era, and uh, and, and on a team that sports writer Davis Walsh uh, said in 1944, he actually called the the Cardinals to win the World Series that year on October 4th of 1944, which I don't think it was a stretch to tell you the truth. Um, he said uh, of the Browns. Um, that they were a comparable uh, nobody whose emotional appeal is great and whose ownership is that of the town's leading money lender, which was uh, Donald Barnes. And uh, Barnes actually bought the team in 1936, which was the same year that uh, McQuinn uh, came up to the major leagues. And, and I'm going to tell you uh, what it said in an article when McQuinn came up. This is from the Dayton Daily News from January 18th, 1936. Judging from his innate love of the game and his undoubted physical ability, George McQuinn, young first baseman, purchased by the Cincinnati Reds from the Newark Club in the International League, should be successful as a major leaguer. Baseball has meant everything to me, says McQuinn. It has meant a living to me. It has provided me with an occupation which allows me to go hunting and fishing to my heart's delight from October until springtime. But above all, it has been a chance to play baseball every day of the summer. I cannot imagine a more attractive and satisfying career. The statement comes not from a callow youth who has just signed his first contract in professional baseball, but from a man who is, though still young, can look back to six full seasons in organized ball, 
McQueen knows he loves baseball. He has the necessary qualifications of speed, hitting, power, and fielding ability. This is a combination which is usually found in the ball players who become the great stars of the game. George McQuinn was extremely well pleased to become a member of the Cincinnati Reds. Quote, I feel that I am to be given a real chance to play in the big leagues. When I had my trials with the Yankees, you know how difficult it would be for any youngster to play the same position as Lou Gehrig. I am sure that I will be Cincinnati's regular first baseman in 1936 and for many years to come, unquote. McQueen was a pitcher while attending Washington and Lee's High School in Boston, Virginia, but didn't like the idea of spending so much time on the bench. So he became a first baseman, enabling him to play ball every day. He turned down a scholarship at William & Mary College so he could play professional baseball. George got his first trial with New Haven in 1930. But was released. Then he signed with the New York Yankee organization, playing for the Wheeling Club and hitting 280 for the season. The next year he was sent to Scranton and there McQuinn hit 315. The following year he moved to Albany and he was meeting the ball at a 345 clip when the league folded up. He finished the year in Birmingham with a 320 record. McQuinn spent 1933 with Birmingham again, and his mark of 357 led the New York Pennsylvania League in batting. He hit 331 as a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs in 1934 and spent the 1935 season with the New York Bears. The new red leg first baseman is a left handed thrower and batsman. He stands 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighs 165 pounds. He is 24 years old and unmarried. His most ardent desire is to play Major League Baseball at least a decade after which he hopes to become a gentleman farmer. McQuinn is of Scotch and English ancestry, has brown hair and gray eyes. His home, Ballston, Virginia, is located a short distance away from Washington, D.C. So, if you're looking to add a card of George McQuinn to your vintage collection, uh, he's actually found in the 1936 National Chickle Fine Pen Premium Set. Uh, it's an action card, uh, and I think he maybe has two of, of cards in that set. Um, they're not my favorite, but uh, if you're looking to add maybe a more traditional card, uh, he's found in the 1939 play ball set and the 1941 play ball set which they're really nice cards um he's also uh, in this set too again this is the 1941 uh w574 or uh w573 um and there's actually two sets identical one for the browns and one for the cardinals and they were both um you could actually purchase both of them at Sportsman Park, and uh, you could, I think you could also mail away for the set as well. Um, and I think maybe it cost people, I want to say 50 cents, but um, they, they came in a really nice box. And, and I'll be talking probably more about this set specifically and the players in it. Um, it it's a really interesting set. Uh, you do have the owners of both teams in it which is really kind of unusual um as far as i know uh you actually have three owners uh sam breeden for the cardinals and uh oh, honestly i think sam breeden should be in the hall of fame by now uh considering his his record uh for um world series wins i think he has 10 and I, i'd like to get your guys opinion uh, whether or not you think that Sam Breeden should be in the Hall of Fame. I do. Uh, you also have Donald Barnes, who is the owner of the Browns. And uh, he, he actually got the team uh, from the Phil Ball estate in 1936. Um, and then uh, you also have uh, Bill DeWitt, who uh, is actually, a I think he's a vice president of the Browns um, during the, during this time. Um, and he gets the team in 1948 through 1950, 
and then he sells it to Bill Veck in 1951. Uh, and Veck kept it until 1953 when the team relocated to Baltimore and became the Orioles. Um, this is actually a different team than the uh, American Association team of the 1880s. Uh, and in that particular incident, um, the St. Louis Browns, uh, under Chris Vonderaik, they won four championships, uh, I believe between 1884 and 1887. And uh, they may have gone to like maybe one more and then lost. But however, uh, during uh, the time in the 20th century that the Browns were around from between 1902 to uh, 1953, they only went to one uh, World Series. They won one pennant in 1944, and uh, George McQuinn here was on that team. I think he was the only one out of the Browns who to actually hit a home run. Um, and and the the Browns actually lost out by one game in 1922 to clinch the American League pennant, um, and, and they lost to the Yankees. Now, the funny thing about the Yankees and uh, George Quinn here is um, that they did pick him up later on in his career in uh, 1947 and then in 1948 uh, he was around. And uh, I think he was actually a favorite of the general manager. And so uh, he actually did uh, receive his release, uh, I, think, I think, after after the 1948 season, so I think in October. And then uh, he actually uh, was a very quiet guy from what everyone says. Uh, he, he was very well liked by uh, a, a lot of ball players and, and um, owners alike. And I, I guess the, the one thing that he really enjoyed to do was uh, when he was on the road, uh, he just, he'd smoke a cigar and just you know watch people uh, you know, walk by and, and just, you know, just chill out. And, and uh, he, he was um, a very, you know, like I said, quiet ball player. And uh, he, he didn't really, he really didn't receive a whole lot of fanfare out there. Uh, but he, he is in the press quite often. Um, and, and so uh, that's, that's kind of my look on George McQuinn. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on George McQuinn or any other ball players that you guys might um, think uh, I should cover in, in the future. And uh, as always, guys, thank you so much for stopping by and give a like and subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, I'll uh, talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.